It's good to pray together, isn't it? Earlier, we heard the amazing account of um, Peter's miraculous escape from prison. And what an amazing picture of the way in which God is in control. God is sovereign. He is Lord. He is in control. But things don't always work out like that. All too often, it feels to me at least, and that God is not in control at all. Suffering happens, pandemics break out. Where is God when this all kicks off? In the verses just before Peter's miraculous escape, we heard about James, the brother of John, and one of Jesus' closest followers. And we heard how um, Herod had him put to the sword, how he had him killed. Why was it that God, who was meant to be in control, allowed James to be killed and then miraculously rescued Peter? Is it that God just likes Peter more than James? That doesn't seem to be true with the God revealed in the Bible. So what is going on? In what sense is it that God is in control when so many of those who follow him, so many of us experience suffering, both collectively and individually? There are perhaps two answers we can give to this question. In what way is God in control? Firstly, we can look at the big picture. We can see the huge sweep of scripture that there is a God who is in control through his creation and then on through our redemption um, and then on into the future um, of our restoration. One day all will be well. One day there will be no more pain and suffering. One day there will be justice and mercy and love and not love as we define it but love that is defined by the very heart of God. One day all will be well. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. When all else seems to be falling apart around me, this is often the truth that I cling to. God is in control. One day we will see this in full. But there's perhaps a second answer that we need to give to this question. In what way is God in control of the world, especially when there's so much uncertainty around at the moment? Perhaps this different way of looking at the question is to ask What does control actually look like? Control for us at this particular moment in history tends to mean control over something. Control over our destiny, control over our decisions, control over our future. Money, education, our connections, these can all be means of trying to control our life. And this pandemic is perhaps a reminder to many of us just how fragile Um, our illusion of control really is. How easily the things that we put our time and energy into sustaining our life, our way of life, how easily these things are shattered. One of the idols of our particular and strange age is the tech startup billionaire. Um, You'll know the story. Someone who who starts with nothing but a few quid in their pocket and a brilliant, bright idea. And through their own competence and initiative, they end up um, having everything you could possibly dream of. Power, influence, wealth, control. Jesus did things the other way around. He started with equality with God, but did not consider this as something to be used to his own advantage, something to be grasped onto. He became human. Um, God to man is quite a drop in status. He became vulnerable. He laid down control. Jesus suffered, most obviously in the lead-up to and on the cross, but also in all sorts of other ways. I think one of the most remarkable passages in the Bible comes in Matthew chapter 14. It begins with the, an account of how John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the one who spiritually and practically prepared the way for Jesus' message of the kingdom. Matthew 14 tells a story, the tragic story, of how he ended up being killed. It's a horrible story involving lust, the abuse of power, and a man, Herod, trying to maintain control 
and authority, desperately clinging on to his own position. Jesus hears the news um, of John's death and he withdraws, or he tries to withdraw, in a private boat to a quiet, deserted place. He wants to be there, one imagines, to grieve, to suffer alone, to just spend some time with God, soaking in his own sorrows, his own hurts. But the crowd, the multitude, they get wind of where Jesus is. So they, they go to him on mass. And Jesus looks at them and sees their pressing needs, their own cases of suffering, of sickness, of disease. And he heals them. He, he loves them. He has compassion on them. After a while, his, um, his disciples um, rock up. You read all this in uh, Matthew 14. I comm- commend you to uh, have it open before you. His disciples rock up, and he, he says something outraged to them. They're, they're pressing him, send these crowds away. They need to go to one of the surrounding villages, which is a good walk from here, to get something to eat, or they're going to be somewhat peckish. And Jesus turns to them, and he asks, and I can't believe he asked this. He, he turns to his closest friends, and he says, you get them something to eat. You, you sort that out. Now, this is no mean feat. There are over 5,000 men, and we don't know how many women and children, in the wilderness, miles from any settlement. Now, now Jesus follows, well, they were a mixed bag, but many of them um, were fishermen. And Peter, it seems, owned his own boat. James and John's dad um, owned their own boat. These were competent businessmen, people who worked their, their whole lives to provide control, to be able to provide for their families, for their descendants. These were hard-nosed people who, who had spent so much of their time with Jesus trying to tell him um, what he should do. They were people who were used to being in control of the situation. And what does Jesus say to them? You go and find this crowd something to eat. This was beyond their ability, beyond their competence, beyond their financial resources. There is nothing they could do to control this situation. So they turn to Jesus as if to say, are you joking? And Jesus says, well, what is it you do have? So they bring together the the five loaves and the two fishes and they say, well, we've got, got this. And you probably all know how the rest of the story goes. Jesus calls his closest followers to lay down their sense of control, their their own competence, their own ability to control the situation. And instead he says, use what you have and come to me. Come to me as, as you are. You see, when God fully revealed himself to us as humanity, he did it not by sitting on a mighty throne, not by um, showing off wealth and power and authority, but by laying down control and being fully human. And then he went and called us to do the same. What is it that you are clinging onto? What are the ways that you are striving to control your life? There's nothing wrong with wanting to do the best by your family, the best uh, by your children. It's not, not wrong to want to try and control things as best you can. But Jesus says, don't spend your whole life striving after all these things. Bring what you have. Come to me. That's the way in which I'm in control. He doesn't take away our suffering. He doesn't click his fingers and makes pandemics and famines and diseases disappear. He calls us to come to him as we are, to know him, to allow him to sustain us. God is in control. In the great sweep of history, we know that everything's heading to a place where one day that will be fully realized. But in the meantime, know this. Whatever your situation, however you are hurting and suffering at the moment, Jesus says this. Come to me as you are. Bring what you have, your five loaves, your two fishes. Know that I'm not going to make the pain go away, but I am going to be with you. I am going to sustain you. I am going to love you, and I'm not going to abandon you to walk in your suffering alone. 
Do you want to pause with me? You may want to just hold your hands open as a sign of not grasping things, but releasing them. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for that promise that you are in control of the big picture, that you created us, that you died for us, that you love us, and one day you will fully um, bring about our reconciliation with you. One day all will be well. There'll be no more pain, no more sickness, and no more suffering. But in the meantime, we want to let go of the things that we grasp onto, the ways in which we try to control things in our fragile world. We come to you as we are, with what we have, knowing that you love us, that you walk with us, that you're here in the midst of the pandemic of uncertainty and of hurt.